Today on Locked On Canadians, should the Montreal Canadiens go after Jonathan Huberdeau? You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 1044, and we thank you all for making us your first listen of the day every single day, as you know. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as here on YouTube, where you can see our shining faces, and if you did notice, my wonderful co-host was cracking his knuckles, because we're about to get into a rant. Uh, my name is Laura Saab, also known as The Active Stick. Um, and I'm joined, as always, by the wonderful Scott Matla. And, and Scott, um, before we get into a lot of thoughts and our feelings, the Canadians have been mathematically eliminated officially, uh, which is not unexpected in any way. Uh, but we were hoping for a game that included fewer shenanigans shenanigans is absolutely one way to describe it this entire thing uh <laughs> to, to just how put would you describe it scott I, in words i can't put on this podcast unless i want to make my co-host do a lot of video editing tonight um this game ended 7-4 the montreal canadians did not admittedly play well in the second period when things really got out of hand Caden Primo was kind of rough in that time. He had a good third period, an okay first period. But the first period of this game set the tone for the entire night here. And this is not to say this is why the Canadians lost. Things can happen very differently in a hockey game. That is a true statement. Four minutes into this game, Caden Gooley is getting collecting a loose puck behind his net he has his back fully turned as he is corralling it along the end boards. You can clearly see his numbers the whole way. This was not a last second turn or a thing where you, he all of a sudden changes directions. The numbers are there. And Nikita Suarat Kucherov comes up and drills him square in the numbers, head first into the boards. Guli is down, bleeding from the mouth, out of the game for the rest of the night. The officials got together for a moment and went, Ah, well, what are you going to do? Let play continue. And then Tampa took the lead. All right. Less than 10 minutes later, Jake Evans is playing a puck in the corner along the boards there. And what happens? Matt Dubba comes up and hammers him in the numbers. There is not a penalty called on this play. Jake Evans luckily was fine. Caden Gooley was out for the rest of this game. We do not know the extent of his injury. Nobody in the NHL gets more benefit of the doubt from officiating than the Tampa Bay Lightning, and I don't understand it. Mike Johnson, at one point in this game, after a tripping penalty was called, was so livid that they can take time to immediately call that on a potentially iffy play there. Not an intentional trip. He stepped on a stick and fell over. But they can't take a moment to look at someone getting hit square in the bloody numbers in their own zone in front of everybody. And I forgot the other part of this. Steven Stamkos cross-checks Alex Newhook in the head. There's not a penalty on that. They each get a roughing penalty. Newhook gets another roughing penalty on top of that. And then Jaden Struble in a tussle with Anthony Sorelli in the net with an official three feet away behind the net and one in front of the net looking at it. They miss him getting speared by Anthony Sorelli and nothing in this game happens. It's so absolutely mind-meltingly stupid that this is the standard of NHL officiating. And this isn't just a Tampa thing. It's just happening because this is fresh in our minds tonight. But oh, my actual Lord and Savior above, are you friggin' kidding me with this? Tampa doesn't need help to beat the Montreal Canadiens. And you're letting Nikita Kucherov run around and do his garbage rat act and act like it's not a problem because he's in the goddamn heart race. Give me an actual break with this. 
call the stupid rule book or set the thing on fire and shove it up your butt because this is ridiculous. The Canadians played with five defensemen with their backup in net. The scoreline reflects that. And then just to cap off what was a very stupid night overall here, Brandon Hagel gets run over by his own teammate and Mikey Isomont, for whatever reason, decides to just grab Arbor Jack Eye from behind. And he, it's the only call they arguably got right in this game, gave him a double minor and gave Jack Eye a penalty because he tried to continue the altercation after that. Canadian's power play didn't do much of anything with that, but I've never been so, it's been a while since I've been this sour after a game where I'm not talking about Slavkovsky had a couple of points in this game. Caulfield scored again. Joel Armia, or Joel Armia tied his career high in goals and is playing really well. Those are things I could highlight had they lost a normal game here. But here I am yelling, frightening the dog, frightening the cat, waking up the neighbors, waking up the other neighbors, keeping my fiance awake, yelling about the frigging officials in a game that was, is ultimately meaningless. The playoffs are 16 days away. And this is what that crap is going to look like. And honestly, I can't believe I'm saying this because I love to poke fun at them. I get why Toronto fans are sick and tired of seeing Tampa in the playoffs. I'm sick of seeing them in the regular season at this point. And I just hope Caden Gooley isn't actually seriously injured going into a pretty busy weekend for the Habs at this point. Pretty busy weekend and an off season where, you know, he needs to recover and, and condition, right? Um, I honestly, this is the thing. Like, like you said, there were good things that happened in this game. There were also bad things that happened in this game that didn't have anything to do with the officiating. But there's like literally the officiating feels like the only thing that happened tonight. And that's terrible because the whole idea with any good officiating in any sport is the fact that the referees or whatever they are, linesmen, umpires, whatever you want to call them, are not the story of the game. In fact, they're not even a paragraph in of a story of the story of a game. And so, like, that's really frustrating because a lot of stuff got overshadowed. I mean, like, like talk about Yoel Armia, what a comeback, right? Being, like unceremoniously dumped to the minors playing really well in the minors getting called back up and then having a career you know highlight season for me like that's something where we should be talking about that we should be talking about Cole Caulfield we should be talking about Uri Slavkovsky because guess what we love talking about Uri Slavkovsky what a great season he's had and what a great season the garbage officiating has had as well. And this is the thing. We knew going into this game, we hate Tampa. We knew it was going to be a mess. But the officials did not help. And it is up to you to set the tone of the game. If you like, That is literally your job. Your job is to enforce rules and set the tone, tone of the game. And here's what they did. They did not enforce the rules and they set the tone of the game in the worst possible direction they could go to. And here's the thing. This is an inconsequential game. We're ranting right now for an inconsequential game. And that's the thing that's really frustrating is that if this was something where, okay, they cost them um, a chance at the playoffs or they cost them a game in the playoffs or something that had a, like something to, you know, to care about, they're still so egregiously bad that they are the story in this segment. I should never know who the officials are in any given sporting event. If I never have to know who is officiating a game, you have done your job properly. That goes for baseball. Why do you think Angel Hernandez trends once every three days during baseball season? The NFL, the officiating, which an entire different rant for our NFL network friends here. But like hockey, I shouldn't know when Chris Lee is refing a game. I shouldn't have ever known when Tim Peel was refing a game. Tonight, uh, Elon, Am or, um, I can't actually pronounce this. I am in your walls. I hope you understand that. I am going to throw a bagel through your window because of how bad you are at your job. It's just, I don't want to talk about officiating. I want to talk about the game but you can't ignore the officiating in this. And again, good things happened in this game. Like I said, Yolar Mia's getting points. Brendan Gallagher and Alex Newhook have been playing really well on a line there. 
Yuri Slavkovsky continues to put up points. Nick Suzuki hit 40 assists. Kov, it's like all these good things are happening, and I'm yelling about some dude wearing stripes who sucks at his job. Like, I, it's 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 over with. And the thing is, the Habs didn't play terribly at five on five overall. Like, it's just, it's just overshadowed. That's it's the thing. overshadowed by dumb bull crap. Like yes. truly and surprisingly, this game didn't spiral as bad as I thought it was going to be. It could yeah. have. This game was absolutely teetering worse. on the edge of becoming a mess. It yes. was a mess for different reasons, but boy, oh boy, are they lucky this didn't get any worse. Right. And speaking of things that are abysmal, Lane Hudson was snubbed for the Hobie again. Uh, and we're, we're going to be talking about that in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees will apply. And now for some legal info. The claim is as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to RIRAs and 401ks. The 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA, available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker-dealer. And Scott, it is time to once again rant about a thing. <laughs> um, actually, like here's the thing with with I think Lane Hudson did get snubbed for the Hobie. I feel like it was less egregious this year than it was last year, but it's still a huge bummer because the competition seemed a little bit harsher this year. And last year he did have that, you know, phenomenal historic record breaking everything season. But I saw you rubbing your hands again. I feel like we're in for another rant. No, I'm not yelling in this one. I'm going to be a little bit more measured in my response uh, with <laughs> this one. So last year, 48 points in 39 games it, for a freshman playing at BU was incredible. And this year, 49 points in 37 games. One more assist uh, than he had last year. Less games played, which is great. He had a more prominent role at World Juniors as well. Uh, he put up six points in seven games. He had four last year played the world championships for them uh, for the USA last year too. I look at this and go people, I think expected another huge jump in things and that we talked a lot about expectations last year. And I look at the finalists this year, Cutter Gauthier, fantastic plays on a very good team has earned that spot. Um, Jackson uh, Blake playing in North Dakota, very good season overall. And I am forgetting the third one off the top of my head, but regardless is that uh, Macklin Celebrini, his teammate, of course, he kind of like Cutter Goche suffers from, oh, there are a lot of good players playing on this team. Lane Hudson was a top 10 in the NCAA in scoring this season. As a defenseman, he is the highest scoring defense. And uh, Zeev Buyam uh, of the University of Denver is right behind him there. But at the same time, it's Macklin Celebrini being so good takes those headlines. Uh, Cutter Goche, I could have gone to Will Smith. I don't think anyone would have fought that too much, but it's disappointing, but understandable, I think, is that I thought he was a longer shot looking at some of the finalists this year uh, because Jackson Blake finished with 60 points this season for the University of North Dakota. Celebrini had 64. Goche had 64 as well. Last year is the year that I kind of have a problem with it. Uh, Adam Fantilli won it, which, okay, that's probably fine. But I look at some of the other people who are nominated, like Matthew Nyes got nominated for this award, and he wasn't even the highest scoring player on his team. And Hudson was top seven in the NCAA last year for scoring. Uh, Sean Farrell also was up there, which is wild. And I probably should have been more upset about that because he played on a smaller team. But anyways, 
my my anger comes that last year I think he deserved the nomination, and this year I understand it, but I really would have preferred that he had gotten the nomination last year. I think he absolutely deserved that. I don't think he's coming back for a third season to try and do what Caulfield did, where Caulfield didn't hit it in his first year, came back and got it in his next year. Uh, I think he's going to be bound for whatever professional level is still playing when he is done with BU this year. But man, it, it kind of sucks that he played on a team that, hey, the other guy in your team was so, so, so good that your really, really good season again kind of goes by the wayside a little bit. And that's the thing. And I think one of the things that it does speak to uh, now that I find is just the level of competition there is for that award nowadays and how, you know, even I would say 10 years ago, we were discussing the NCAA in a very, very different light, right? Um, and I know part of it is that Kent Hughes does love his NCAA players, particularly from, um, is there Northeast a division? Uh, Northeast, it's Hockey East. It's Hockey East. Northeastern plays in Hockey East. Okay, there you go. Um, and so, as you can tell, I am not the NCAA expert on any show, uh, not just this one, <laughs> um, but you know, like, I feel like it just, it speaks to the level of talent that there is, and it speaks to the way that it's being seen differently, um, which I really, really do appreciate. But in terms of Lane Hudson, like you said, like, if he's back for a third season, it's going to be a little bit surprising because we do expect him to make that jump. He ne doesn't necessarily seem to be in a massive hurry, but you can tell he's got his sights on being an NHL regular. He's got his sights on being a contributor and you know you expect him to take whatever the next step is for that and whatever the next step is for his growth um i just for me like what i want to look at is what are the next steps for him so scott assuming he you know he finishes and there's three nhl games left or however many ahl games left like what do you think the canadian should be advising him to do this summer in order to come back next year and make one of the pro teams well he'll be on one of the pro teams let's say make the nhl i think that if he's up for it they will assign him to the ahl they might sign him to a contract and just let him go to worlds where i think he'll play a big role uh the biggest thing is just continue to work on building your strength and your timing at the next level. We know he has that uncanny kind of sixth sense for things, but adjust to that speed to the next level. We've seen him play at Worlds, and we've seen that sometimes he can get a little out-muscled. It's not the end of the world. Continue working on that. I think above anything else, they would love to have him in the AHL lineup. That team is absolutely crying out for another offensive weapon because Justin Barron, you know, all things considered, is struggling just a little bit. I think he'd make a huge impact there, but I think the out of everything else, depending on how BU season goes and the frozen four on the 11th uh, is they want to see, okay, a couple of NHL games end the season and then go to worlds, then spend this entire off season, maybe working with some of the skill staff. Another thing like your ice did and doing all the little things to get to that next level. We know how much the Canadians have invested in that. And I don't think it'll be just him. I think I do think Luke Tuck is going to get an entry level contract out of this. He's someone that they might see, you know, a big power forward in there and he'll spend the year with the AHL team next year. We haven't heard anything on Rhett Pitlick or Luke Middlestad, which tells me they're going back to Minnesota next year. But I think the biggest thing is, Hey, let's start kind of getting him whenever his season ends, let's start ramping him into that pro game here. And even if it means you're going to play third pairing minutes alongside Jaden Struble or Jonathan Kovacevic or whomever, and they're going to make we're going to have them kind of be your buffer guy here as you get adjusted. And we could see him very, very quickly grow into a pretty big role in those three games, depending on how he adjusts. Um, and we're obviously going to keep an eye on that. As you know, this podcast is a Lane Hudson Stan podcast. Um, but in the meantime, we do have some mailback questions. It is Friday. So let's have some fun and talk about whether or not the Canadians should trade for Jonathan Huberdo. That's a name we haven't talked about in a while. <laughs> uh, and that's coming up in just one moment. But first, this episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. 
eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. And it is time for the Friday mailbag. We got some good questions and some observations. Um, so I did want to start with our really good friend, Robert Rice because he is our very good friend, and he is responding to uh, our last episode when we talked about Tijit Iginla as a hab. Have to weigh in on the draft speculation, because while I wouldn't say the idea of Iginla as a hab would make me cringe, but if a name like Demidov or Kat uh, Katten, Berkeley Catton is available, uh, it's it feels to be a significant hindrance. If this is the last year the Canadians will be drafting this high, then they need to swing at the highest upside forward they can get, because despite being in a rebuild, they remain quite thin for amateur prospects with top six potential. If this need isn't handled well in the draft, they could find themselves overbidding for free agents or expending a lot of assets in a trade to correct the shortfall. So this was just an observation, but obviously, as it is our good friend Robert Rice, I did want to share it. Um, and I do agree. I think like one of the things that we were talking about yesterday is that this is not something that the Canadians should should use that you know top six or top seven pick four so i actually kind of look at this too and i i slightly disagree with the fact that they might not be drafting this high because they have calgary's pick next year and the flames are trending towards being dookie next year uh pretty badly so the opportunity is there especially with their own first which is we're hoping is closer to 20s than 10s uh, in that uh, in that way there. I think this year, I, I've kind of learned that maybe I'm not the, I will admit this fully, I'm not always the best analyst of who they've drafted. I've kind of enjoyed uh, David Reinbacher and watching Yaris Lefkowski generate. And we haven't seen what the 2022, 2020, yes, 2022 class can fully do at the pro level yet. Slaff is the only one who's played multiple games at that, actual games at that level. Owen Beck played one emergency game. Philip Mashar has like three AHL games under his belt. Lane Hudson's still in college, not counting guys like Cedric Indon, Vincent's Roar, et cetera, that I think they're doing a good job actually hitting on a lot of these other later round picks to make the most out of it. I, I agree with taking a swing on someone like Demidov or maybe Berkeley Catton, but if they see something that fits the way this team plays or how they want them to play, I kind of get what they're doing. Yeah, maybe it took Slavkovsky like a year or so, but look at him now. Someone asked me that if Vincent LeCavier was the one working with him because a lot of what they're seeing reminds them of when LeCavier was a very young player in the NHL growing into the game, and I think that's an incredible compliment to play somebody. If they see something in Tijiginla that they think can fit into this lineup – whether it be goal scoring or pace or playmaking or something. And I think with the Ginla, it is goal scoring. Absolutely. I still think that someone like Iserman's going to see their name come up a lot there, but I guess I'm not as worried about it right now. But if I start hearing like eh, defenseman and everything, then I kind of go, no, mm -hmm. we've, we've done the defenseman rant already. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So another question from Stefan, uh, why does Scott always have a hat or a cap on? <laughs> because I have a terrible haircut currently, and I'm going <laughs> to leave it at that. I also just, I am constantly wearing hats to begin with. So, like, I, if you go back to, like, almost all of our shows, in most of them I have a hat on. That's, it's just what I do. I wear a hat most of the day, except when I'm going to bed or something. So, um, that is definitely a Scottism. And then the serious question from Stefan is, what big trade can we do with San Jose? They need lots of our young players and draft picks, so why not package lots to get their first pick? So judging from the hurdle trade, I think it's not entirely out of the question 
that someone can get San Jose's first overall pick if they get it, if they win it. So, and here's my thing about this is San Jose has two first round picks this year and has two next year. Like the Penguins pick is right now trending to be in the mid twenties, right around the time when the Jets picks are too. I just, I'd rather the Canadians keep their assets. And like, here's the thing is if they're offering up, like we want, I'm sure the ask starts at Lane Hudson, but if they say, Hey, we want Owen Beck and your first, and then like another first in like a couple of years for this year's first overall pick, do you do it? We also haven't, you know, shown that they've actually won, won the first overall pick yet. I might not say no because you put Macklin Celebrini in this Canadians lineup and things change very quickly, but the Sharks have so many bodies to resign in the coming years that uh, I'm curious what they're going to do. I don't think they're going to start trading picks when they want to fill in all of that with young prospects at this point. So um, we did get a question from our good friend KCD about Lane Hudson, but we've kind of answered it in the first in the previous segment. Um, so I'm going to go to our Huberto question. So this is this comes from Pinard88 on um, Twitter. Hey gang, just a random thought I had for topic for chaos sake. With Kent Hughes building a reputation for Montreal becoming the land of second chances, such as Doc or Newhook, and being a pretty savvy negotiator, what are your thoughts on Huberto? I know that contract is an albatross, but if they, if somehow they would be able to convince Calgary to retain salary, not sure if this is feasible, but looking at Huberto's stats, the guy scored 115 points in a season. We all know the dumpster fire that is the Calgary Flames, pun intended, and maybe Huberto could use a change of scenery. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, and thank you for the kind words about the podcast. All right, so, Scott, you... Uh, are looking presumably judging from the look on your face. You are looking at the uh, contract. Jonathan his contract's Hugo. basically lockout proof because most of his money is in signing bonuses. Seven million this year, seven million next year, seven million the year after that, nine and a half after that, nine and a half after that, seven million, nine and a half, five million dollars. Sixty-one and a half million dollars of his eighty-four million dollar contract is in signing bonuses and it is a 10 and a half million dollar cap hit every single year this year he has 46 points in 73 games after having 55 and 79 last year and 115 in florida a couple of years ago that's not what you call an upward trend i look at some of his florida years where 54 59 26 in an injury shortened year 69 nice 92 78 61 115 there was a trend of things kind of getting better there. And then all of a sudden down to 55 down to 46, he'll probably end around the same point total. Unless there is heavy salary retention involved in this, not a chance. I do not want to. The the suggestion was half the salary. I don't think you can get Calgary to do that, but if you can get a significant amount, would you still do that? If I can get a, and he's also 30 years old at this point, and that contract runs until he is 38, that the length of it, the cost of it, and just the age of the player, it's a no for me unless it is, you know, traded and traded again, like double retention on this, because this is looking like it'll be an albatross with a $10.5 million cap hit. It's asking too much. And just to get teams to retain on this, and I would rather go for potentially somebody else in free agency or see what the development looks like. I don't love the idea of it unless the, the asking cost is dirt cheap and there's some retention involved in this. It's just, I thought, it, I knew it was bad when it was signed. I forgot how bad it looks now. Like $10.5 million is top of the NHL kind of money. I don't think anyone thinks Jonathan Huberto is a top of the NHL player at this point. Right. And so one of the things that I did want to mention is obviously, you know, when people were talking about his 115 point season, saying that's not the uh, season that should be considered when signing him to a new contract, uh, Huberto's agent went on the offensive and got really upset and started yelling at columnists and journalists about it and talking 
you know, talking crap. And then he got signed to this contract. And I do understand that last year there were some coaching issues with the Calgary Flames. There were management issues with the Calgary Flames. Um, and this year they're just not a good team. But that is a, a massive drop. It is a massive drop. Like, to me, somebody, like, when you're looking at Jonathan Huberto, you're looking at a guy who, if things go right, you can expect 80 points from him if everything goes right. But if a single thing goes wrong, take a look at his record. 40s, 50s. It's not great. So I do appreciate the question and, you know, and the and the throwing, um, throwing a wrench into it to kind of, like, cause a chaotic discussion. And I do think that Huberto... Being given a second chance is a great discussion to have. I just feel like with that contract, it's a moot point. Like if this is a guy who was making a little bit less money, like I do think it would be, well, quite a bit less money. I do think it would be worth it giving him a second chance. Like, like he could absolutely be the change of scenery kind of player that can thrive in a different environment, particularly coming up, coming back from somewhere where he's, he's got a bitter history and, you know, like, I, I feel like it's understandable that, like, quote, unquote, it, it's hard to make it work in Calgary. But as a second chance, like, he would be a great pickup if it weren't for that contract. It's literally the contract just makes it a no, no go, no, non-starter. It's asking too much of a team that has a different plan in mind. If he were 26, maybe it's different, but he's 30 now. This is the downside of his career. And we saw for years with the Canadians what happens when you sign old dudes who were good once. Sometimes <laughs> you get Alex Kovalev, and sometimes you get Alex Semin. Only you're, we didn't pay Alex Semin $10 million. So it's it's I understand the thought behind it, but it's a no. It's I just don't see it as a good idea for the Canadians at this point. I do appreciate the, the, the chaos, though. And if you want to send chaos our way, uh, please do so only in the form of mailback questions um, and not in any other formats. Thank you. You can send uh, you can send them to us on Twitter, LO underscore Canadians. You can also email us at LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. Uh, leave them in the YouTube comments. I do know there's mailback questions still that we haven't tackled that we'll get to next week. And if you've mentioned a prospect that you want us to discuss, we will ask our prospect guests about them. So make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts as well as on YouTube. We thank you so much for listening and we will see you all next time.